centre fire 600. We look at what 600 British pounds can get you in a gun shop at current exchange rates anyway. Feet of clay shooting. 800 people shot at Jack Pike's Pro Sporting. So why do more people go to a clothing brand shoot than a classic run by a major shooting association? We have news, we have hunting YouTube. Welcome to Field Sports Britain. As a shooting journalist, I come across quite a few rifles and I talk about quite a few rifles. And over the last few months, we've been um, dealing with some very expensive rifles. We have the kit plows, you know, 15,000 pounds. We have the straight pulls, which start at about 3,000 pounds. So when I go into a, a gun shop with, let's say, 600 pounds, what do I get? It's rather good. Right, this is the Ruger American. And this, to me, is a very, very typical 600 pound rifle. We have the, the start of the teak is around about the 700 to 800 pound mark. We have the brownies around the 700 to 800 pounds mark. Um, but with the Ruger, they're the same time price bracket as the, the CZ rifle centre fires. So it's pitched right in the lower end of the market. But who's going to buy a rifle like this? I think it could be the person who's starting his hunting. He wants to buy himself a less expensive rifle, perhaps. Or sometimes you probably find uh, a gamekeeper will have, this, have a rifle like this because he will abuse it. All he wants is that rifle to shoot accurately and function properly and to be reliable. So therefore he doesn't care if it's got nice twiddly triggers on it and nice wood or nice uh, synthetic uh, stock on it. He doesn't care a jot. He wants to put it up and shoot a fox or deer with it. Simple as that. So it does actually cover a, a, a quite a wide range of people. The beginner, and maybe also the professional. So it's actually got to tick a lot of boxes. Let's take the rifle apart. Some people don't like doing this. If you're a hunter, you think, oh my God, what am I doing? But I do it all the time. And it's quite fun seeing where the money's gone for these rifles. And very often, you know, there's two places where you check first and check, see where the quality has been cut perhaps. Because less expensive rifles, you think, have they made a few shortcuts? Have they made a few cost savings? So let's pull it apart. Starting with a stock. I mentioned the stock earlier on. It's a bit hollow, it's a bit bendy, yeah, yeah, but a lot of these stocks are, you know, a lot of these stocks, and rifles under about a thousand pounds, you know, the stocks are a bit bendy, and when you put a bipod on them, there's a lot of pressure on the front, on the fore end, and, you know, they say they're free floating, but very often they're not. You know, the barrel does actually rub against the end of the fore end, and sometimes that can affect accuracy, sometimes it doesn't. On this one, it's quite unusual. Most rifles will have a, a big recoil lug, perhaps bolted between the, or sandwiched between the actual barrel and the, and the receiver. Um, but on this one, it's got some recesses actually in the action itself. You can see those there. And they mate up with these uh, steel inserts within the stock itself. So it's an unusual way to do it. They're, they're fore and aft, they're front and rear. They've actually got these, these, uh, this bedding system. And uh, it's quite nice because when you put it all together, When I, when I bolt it together, I've got steel on steel on steel. So I've got a bolt going through a steel insert and that locates onto the action. So the whole thing's pulled in. So I'm not actually crunching the, the stock itself. And lots, some of the, the, the cheaper, more um, competitive stocks, they, they crunch up. But this is absolutely rock solid. So it's just an observation with this Ruger American. The other area where we look at is the trigger. Everybody's barking on about having these very, very super light triggers. You don't really need a super light trigger unless you're doing long range varminting, unless you actually are used to it. A six pound trigger is absolutely fine if you are used to a six pound trigger. This trigger itself is a, an adjustable one between three and five pounds. It's a marksman trigger. It's very similar 
in the way it looks uh, as the Accu trigger or the Marlin, Marlin X7 trigger. It's got a little kind of inner trigger and that's safety. I can't pull that back unless I pull that bit back. It's just a safety device which has come out of America. It's just kind of unusual thing but it's becoming more and more common on, on some of the American rifles. So the trigger is, is an area where quality can cause problems. You know, the better quality rifles have a really, really crisp trigger. Um, this one's actually got a really, it's got about a four or five pound pull, but there's a bit of creep. Not a major problem. If you get used to it, it doesn't really matter. So don't get too wound up about triggers. It's how you deal with them and how you get used to using them. One of the things I'm a great believer in, and, and this is probably hasn't changed over 25 years, if you're buying a rifle, invest in the glass, invest in the optics. So there's nothing wrong in investing in a 600 pound rifle, but what really, really counts is having a really, really good optical system on the, on, the, on the rifle. So it doesn't matter if you are spending twice the amount of money on the optics and the rifle. That's the right way to do it. Don't spend all your money on the, op uh, on the rifle and have really, really poor optics. Because when you're out shooting, when the light drops, you want good quality glass. So therefore, that is very, very important. On this rifle, we've got a, uh, a Tiger moderator. I've never used these before. They're very, very lightweight. Made in Switzerland, quite robust, out of aluminium, and they're very, very light. I mean, you know, I'm quite surprised. And uh, we'll see how this performs. So it's quite compact as well. So um, we'll see how that, um, how that goes in a few minutes time when we start doing the accuracy testing. So how does a 600 pound rifle shoot? This is a um, triple two fifty, um, inherently a very, very accurate round. We've got 50 grain ammunition running out about 3750 feet per second. It's quite feisty, typical foxing caliber. In fact, it's probably one of the best calibers you get for foxes. So I um, bore sighted the, the uh, rifle and then I pulled it in a wee bit. Then I did a very quick accuracy test um, this afternoon in probably about 20 mile an hour winds, but the wind was coming straight at me. And uh, you can see, you know, very simplistically, we've got about just under an inch accuracy, one MOA at 100 meters. And that's after about eight or nine shots. So that's not bad. I've got another rifle at the moment I'm testing, a varminting rifle, and it's okay. uh, twice the price of this, and it's shooting the same accuracy. David asked me why am I eating grass? Well, for 55 years I suffered from hay fever and I'm a farmer's son, so this time of year is absolute hell for me. I hate it. Anyway, so um, I met somebody, uh, an old boy up in Suffolk, and he said to me, he said, oh boy, the way to stop you hay fever is to eat grass. So for the last month, six eating a blade of grass and uh, perhaps it's just, it's just the year we're in at the moment but for some reason my hay fever has not really affected me so don't know what it is I'm still taking the pills I still, still keep on taking loads of things to stop my eyes itching my nose um, dribbling but for some reason this year it's been very very manageable so anyway probably an old wives tale but who cares it works for me this year so You know, I, there's some grasses out there which taste really quite disgusting. Some are bitter, some are sweet. So I've become quite a connoisseur of grass. And that bit of grass over there is really quite tasty. <laughs> so what do you expect from a 600 pound rifle? It's gonna probably feel a bit hollow. It's gonna probably be slightly bendy on the fore end, I suppose. This one's got an integral Trigger guards are all part of the stock. Perhaps, you know, on a, a more expensive rifle, you'll have a, a separate trigger guard, which is made of either plastic or, or steel. The, the magazine, I mean, even some of the more expensive rifles have got plastic magazines. At the end of the day, <laughs> they're hard plastic. They still work perfectly well, so does it really matter? Well, I suppose it doesn't feel as nice, but who cares, really, you know? 
the bolt. It, it works, it's functional. Look, I mean, you can't get any smoother than that. So does it really matter? It ejects, it feeds properly. So actually, does it really matter? It may not look quite nice to some of these fancy bolts. You pay for what you get, but at the end of the day, you have a rifle which performs, and that's probably the most single important thing. And as I said straight from the start, this will attract the professional gamekeeper or hunter who just wants a working rifle which is reliable, rugged, and just gets on with it, or perhaps is entry level, and it suits both people. But at the end of the day, it's a rifle which shoots less than an inch. What more can you ask? Thank you, Tim, showing how much rifle you get for your £600, your $781, your €682, Euros, or your 0 0.28 bitcoins. Now, someone who doesn't know his cratchers from his pesetas, it's David on the Field Sports Channel News Stump. This is Field Sports Channel News. A US hunting TV star has been dropped by Outdoor Channel for letting an elk go to waste. Bill Buspis Jr. admitted he accidentally killed a calf elk while trying to shoot a large bull elk on his ranch. The former chairman of the Louisiana Wildlife and Fisheries Commission said that after the sun went down, he instructed the ranch manager and the cameraman to drag the calf elk into an irrigation ditch to conceal it. However, he was spotted by a local game warden. Outdoor suspended the show, Wild Game Nation, and its host from appearing on the network. British sporting sculpture partnership Wilson Gearing have unveiled some new work. Sculptures Susie Wilson and Jenna Gearing are holding the exhibition in Northleach, Gloucestershire. The centrepiece shows foxhounds leaping a fence, which has been on a tour of summer shows starting with badminton. American Antis have a new group in their sights. Wildlife Services is the US government's official animal wrangling agency, including tranquilizing moose involved in accidental criminal damage, which is what happened here, and fox and coyote shooting. The agency has been run by the US Department of Agriculture since 1931. Now a group of antis led by Project Coyote has taken to the Californian courts to try and close down its predator shooting role. There's a new rifle scope combo in UK gun shops. A viewer sent us this picture from the Sauer factory in Germany and we wondered what it was. Now we know. The Keeper package is a special offer that consists of a Sauer 100 XT and 223, Minox Z5i 3-15x56 illuminated scope and Barton Gunworks sound moderator, all for £2,100. A rhino horn auction is to go ahead in South Africa. A court overturned a 2009 ban on domestic sales of rhino horn and at least one breeder plans an online auction. International sales remain banned. Each rhino's horn is safely and regularly trimmed by a veterinarian and capture team. Rhino farmers point out that legal and sustainable growing of rhino horn is the only long-term solution to combat rhino poaching. And finally, a cricketer is batting against hunting. Kevin Peterson, the controversial South African-born England cricketing star, has launched a campaign to save rhinos and show off his anti-hunting credentials at the same time. He's bringing poaching crimes to the attention of his followers via Twitter and has launched a range of rhino cricket bats. You are now up to date with Field Sports Channel News. Stalking the stories, fishing for facts. Thank you, David. Next up, we're off to the Jack Pike Pro Sporting, which is rapidly becoming one of the most popular shoots in the British clay shooting calendar. What is the secret to a shooting competition's success? Is it the target's accessibility prize pot? Well, whatever it is, they're doing it at the Jack Pike Open, and we've come along to discover just what it is. The Open consists of a pool shoot, a high tower, and 120 testing targets. It's held at Sporting Targets Clayground in Bedfordshire, and with 800 shooters travelling from all over to attend this event, it makes it bigger than some of the European or World Championships. And there is even a Championship score setting the pace, Leading the way is Aaron Harvey with a respectable 116. It's brilliant, yeah, we've got massive support from um, Jack Pike. Uh, Gavin at Thatchery's um, supported it from the start. 
obviously hence the name. So we're now in their eighth year and um, they continue to support, support us very well. Everybody that comes gets something to go away with. We, we've got a sponsorship from Pillar this year as well. So we're giving a set of magnetos every day, which is a, which is a very good prize. Um, local Evans Horseshaw Ford, they've sponsored the pool stand. So, you know, there's a hundred pound every day for that. We've got stuff as well from CCI, Chromatic. So all the sponsors, it's, it's brilliant just to have them on board. Fiocchi, they've given us 8,000 cartridges. So there's something for everyone to take away. Sporting's on and up at the moment. As well, there's a lot of people out there doing competition shooting. Um, we try and give good value, um, put a good shoot on, give f good friendly service, and add those little extra things in, you know, a lot of goodie bags, the extra prizes waters, apples on, on the stands and that sort of thing. You know, it all helps to, to bring people along and have an enjoyable day, not just a competition. Among the crowds of competitors are the Jack Pike sponsored shots here in Good Spirits. Andy Crow is in attendance and looking to take more of a social crown. That's a good shoot. We've got nice challenging targets here, coming off the tower here and that. So, uh, but it's just a chance for all the sponsors from Jack Pike. They, we all get together on one of the days and today's the day, giving each other, each, giving each other a load of sticks. Uh, no, it's been good fun. I've missed some silly ones like uh, the rabbit. That's, that's cost me big time, that has, because they've got a few rabbits here and I don't know why. I'll probably shoot more rabbits with a 1.7 than I can with my shotgun, so um, I'll probably do better bringing a 1.7 next year and shoot the rabbits with that, but I'm, I've, I've done well. I've, I've beat the boys from Jack Pike and that's the main thing. That's what it's all about, trying to beat them. I've come out quits, quits on top, we always put a bit of a bet on, so that's my goal for the day, that is. There are 15 different layouts and 120 targets to be tackled by the shooters in just one day. It is as much of a mental challenge as a physical one. A uh, good event on the calendar every year, shot it, shot it the last sort of three years in a row, I think, and um, this year come back as part of the Jack Pike team and shot with the shoot with the guys. I think the last two years in a row, I've been one place out of the prizes. So this year it would be nice to come in, you know, the top position, top positions, and obviously pick up something. It's all, it's all fairly close, all fairly fillable cars at the moment. But I've got a feeling it's uh, supposed to open out a little bit more and get a bit more testy and rangy. Ford Evans Holshaw are supporting the event and are including cash prizes each day for the highest score on the pool shoot. But the talk of the day is the high tower. Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen it this year. It's a killer. It, it, it really is a killer. This one, sir. But no, there's, there's some fairly good scores in there. I think there's a 45 or 46. I think Mark Windsor put in. So that's a that's a seriously good score. And apparently there's some real long ones. There is plenty for everyone taking on the course, with the social side remaining a big draw for those who aren't in with a chance of a podium finish. Started off OK. Um, it's, it's quite different this year. There's a lot of close targets in the early stands, which kind of suits me because I'm not very good. Um, but now we're starting to get to some of the longer stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm reverting to type. Normally shoot every year with these guys, um, mostly because it's, uh, it's good fun, you know. Um, obviously the Jack Pike boys are clients of ours and it's nice to come and spend a bit of time and have a chat, plenty of banter. Um, to let you know how badly you're shooting, that's for sure. It's, it's, it's well organised, for one. You know, there's no waiting around on the stands most of the time. You know, it's, it's efficiently run. All the traps are reliable, everyone's friendly. You know, it's, it's well policed, well secured. Um, it's a nice ground, you know. I, I can see why it's, why it's proved popular and I can see why the numbers are growing. For me, I, I shoot with uh, the old Gits Club, as I call them today. <laughs> uh, we just have a really good day. It's good fun, it's very well organised here. Um, you, you get round really easily and we just have a good time. The results come rolling in and Aaron Harvey manages to hang on to his place as high gun but he's joined by two other shooters, Richard King and Olympic gold medalist Richard Folds. Congratulations to them. With the event being another huge success, there's no telling how big this competition could get. We'll see you next year to find out. A great day out with Crow sparkling there. I like his idea of a 1.7 HMR for the rabbit stand. Now from Bedfordshire to the wider world of hunting and shooting on YouTube, it is Hunting YouTube. In 
This is Hunting YouTube, which aims to show the best hunting and shooting videos that YouTube has to offer. And it's another big week for boar on YouTube. Zach is out with knives and dogs after gnarly hogs in New Zealand. He heads out with a mate for a couple of nights chasing down pigs. In Alabama, USA, Jake, Evan and Justin are on a hog hunting road trip armed with thermal and night vision. Feral hogs remain a massive pest in the USA, especially in the American South. Badra Chasseur, who is French or Moroccan, puts up this film of driven wild boar on some hot, steep Mediterranean hillside. It doesn't end well for this pig. More classic sport in the Pyrenees, where Ilka Dorn, editor of German hunting magazine Halali, is after chamois. In Australia, another German hunting room is on a buffalo hunt. He's near the Kakadu National Park with a Blazer R8 in 375 Holland and Holland. McHugh CB is using a Blazer BBF 97 in Victoria, Australia to shoot foxes flushed by his Dachshunds. This is a cross between a driven big game day and what we Brits would call bolting foxes. It's only a trailer, but there is some stunning photography in Britain on the ducks. Mojo TV is a US cable channel TV show about duck hunting out this summer. And finally, here's the thing. While the British are getting excited about Target Sprint, which combines athletics with their guns, the Americans are going for Train to Hunt, which mixes bow hunting with a mountain version of The Gym. This is the Pennsylvania leg of the Train to Hunt US tour. That's it for this week. I've put all these films into a playlist for you. Click on the link or check this film's description. If you have a YouTube film you would like us to pop into the weekly top 8, email me the link, charlie at fieldsport channel.tv well that is it for this week if you haven't done so already please pop over to our website fieldsportschannel.tv where you can click to like us on facebook follow us on twitter you can subscribe to us on youtube you can pop your email address into our register page and we'll contact you about this show field sports britain it's at 7 p.m uk time every wednesday and this has been field sports britain good hunting good shooting good fishing and goodbye